Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt. I'm the social studies specialist for the Maine Department of Education. I'm very excited today to welcome for the first time in my three and a half years in this position, um, a very unique opportunity um, in talking with a lot of the panelists today. This might be the first time in a long time that we've had all of these groups at the table. We have the Maine Historical Society, the Maine State Archives, the Maine State Museum, and the Maine State Library. We have all been working together for eight months, nine months, 10 months, it's been a while, um, for almost a year on this project that we are debuting today with this first set of primary source resources. And so thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I will let all of our, uh, my fellow panelists introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their organizations in just a moment. Uh, but I was tasked with giving an overview of how we got here and why we got here because um, I guess in large part because of me. I had an inspiration one night and I reached out to the, all of the groups uh, um, listed here again, the Historical Society, Archives, Library, Museum. And I said, we now have new social studies or revised social studies standards. We should get primary source sets together that teachers can take in small little bundles and say, I'm now going to use these in teaching about the social studies standards. And so with that, um, the work began. We started by trying to develop uh, key topics and understandings of what we would need to pull together. We had the different organizations searching through uh, their resources because the question wasn't necessarily, was there stuff available? But the question was, what should be made um, highlighted? What should be made available and highlighted? And how can it be tied together in lesson plans? Then, as many of you probably know, COVID-19 uh, hit the country and changed a lot of things. And so we then went to work on a series of primary sources related, related to teaching about pandemics. And so you're going to see the first set of those resources today. But keep in mind the process and everything that you're about to get walked through this afternoon is the same process that you will use for all of the additional primary source sets that will soon to be released. I think there's four or five that are just about ready, um, then another four or five that are being worked on for in the future. So again, welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, we are here because the use of primary sources is a key component of social studies education and it's found throughout the main learning results. And I was, uh, am lucky enough to get to work with the great organizations of primary sources here in Maine of the Historical Society, Archives, Library, and Museum. And we are here today to share about a year's worth of work with you. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the Maine Historical Society for their introductions. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Kathleen Newman, the Manager of Education and Public Programs at Maine Historical Society. And also here from MHS is uh, Brittany Cook, our Bicentennial Fellow. Maine Historical Society was founded in 1822 and today is based in Portland, where we have a museum building with gallery and visitor spaces, a research library, and the Wadsworth Longfellow House, the childhood home of the writer Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Our museum gallery store and library are open, uh, though presently our hours are limited, as is our capacity. So if you're interested in visiting, please visit our website, mainhistory.org, to see our hours and to make a reservation. And also right now, all of our public programming is virtual. And that the information to join those programs or to see recordings of past programs is also on our website. We have a very strong online presence with our database main memory network where more than 270 different collecting organizations and also some individuals from across the state have come together to share digitized collections. It's a great resource to find primary sources, online exhibits and lesson plans. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Brittany, um, if she would like to say a little, um, just something about uh, those online lesson plans. 
Sure. Um, so again, my name is Brittany. I have been working uh, with Maine Historical Society as their Bicentennial Education Fellow. So I've been um, working on a lot of materials relating to Maine's Bicentennial, the 200th year of statehood. So um, part of that is our Bicentennial Education Initiative, uh, which you can find online, mainmemory.net slash bicentennial for all of those resources, including lesson plans for grades K through 12, which include a lot of those primary source materials that you can find find on Main Memory Network, um, activities for students, and several um, distance learning activities as well on our virtual learning hub, which is mainmemory.net uh, slash distance learning. Um, and we can definitely share out all of those um, URLs for you if you're interested in accessing those materials. Um, and we are also um, uh, in having uh, teachers from around the state contribute lots and plans to our Bicentennial Initiative as well. So if you have any questions about that, please let us know. Thanks, Brittany. And uh, thanks, Joe. So that's Maine Historical Society. All right, let's move to the library, Allison, if you'd like to dive in. Sure. I'm Allison Maxell. I'm the Director of Public and Outreach Services at the Maine State Library. The Maine State Library is a state agency that uh, has been tasked to support all other state agencies as well as um, all library uh, and librarians throughout the state. Um, we are in the rather unfortunate circumstance right now, if you have uh, seen the news, in that the cultural building, which houses the museum archives and library, is presently closed and undergoing renovations. Um, but like a phoenix, we will rise, and uh, plans are in place for the library to relocate to uh, another facility just down the street um, at 242 State Street, where we will um, be able to have a limited uh, footprint and hopefully re-engage in most of our services that we provide uh, to all libraries throughout the state. Uh, we just don't have any date yet. Um, we have a tremendous uh, collections um, strength, which we're so thrilled to be able to participate with the other colleagues here. Uh, as Joe said, the combined collections and resources of all our institutions is pretty powerful and uh, we're delighted to be here today to uh, kind of demonstrate, show you a little bit of a sampling um, as to what we can do and, and hopefully to support um, you in the important work uh, that we know you're doing and all of us under these um, kind of difficult circumstances that we're facing in the new reality of today. Um, we have a very strong print and virtual presence as well. Um, I will make sure that all the uh, URLs and website information is available to you um, at the end of the program. Uh, so I will turn it over to, is it Heather this next? Sure. Um, thank you again, everyone, for being here. My name is Heather Moran. I am the Reference and Outreach Archivist at the Maine State Archives. And um, we have, we the archives, have about 95 million pages of material. Uh, we are tasked with um, caretaking the state documents, um, various state agencies, as well as the executive branch, the legislature in the court. So we have a vast amount of material uh, that is um, available for research. Um, as Allison mentioned, unfortunately, our building is um, currently closed um, due to renovations. Um, but certainly you can reach out to the archivists um, and uh, request help with primary sources. That's what we're here for. We do have a digital presence. Um, our website is www.digitalmain.com. We do share that um, with the Maine State Library and um, I'm certainly available to assist. So I look forward to working with you all as we navigate um, the coming school year. So I'll turn it over to who's next. Um, We're up to Joanna. Or Joanna, yeah. Hello everyone. Um, 
I am Joanna Toro from the Maine State Museum. I'm the chief educator here. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Kate Weber, who is also a lead educator, and Emma Soler, who is an intern that has worked a tremendous amount on this project, um, our pandemic primary source set, and you're gonna benefit from, from her wonderful work um, as, we, as we demonstrate um, the materials we've gathered for you. So I really wanna, first of all, thank her for all the hard and thoughtful work that she has done um, this summer in putting together these materials and moving us farther uh, along than we could possibly have done by ourselves. Um, Kate and, and I are part of the, the Maine State Museum education team. And as our colleagues in the cultural building have already mentioned, the building is um, closed for renovations and updates. And the museum actually opened for seven days, really optimistic, thinking that we could open on a limited, limited basis and shut down again after our HVAC system failed and it got very, very hot here. Um, so we're moving to our digital uh, presence. Um, our website is mainstatemuseum.org. Of course, the Maine State Museum has collections not only in history, but in archaeology uh, and natural sciences. So we have a wealth of um, topics that we cover and materials that are available. And um, our learn section has been um, populated with a lot of those materials, including our bicentennial um, primary source sets with this, this team put together earlier um, this year in celebration and, and uh, reflection of our, our bicentennial. And um, they are a similar format than the materials you're going to see here today. Um, so that's a wonderful resource as well. So with that, I think we should get going and exploring our pandemic set and see what we um, hopefully um, can offer to you. And hopefully this is going to be a good service um, to all of you in the, the days coming in the, in the future. All right, thank you. Yeah, so um, we've done our introductions. Um, it's great to see all of your faces here. I see your names in your boxes. Um, for those of you joining us a little bit late, um, we are going to be breaking out into groups that can specifically talk to the different age ranges we're working with. So if, um, if you know how to edit your Zoom name, go to the top of your little screen, to the top right corner, there are three buttons um, right above your face or your box and you can edit your name to include which group you'd like to be in. Um, so that'll be a big help to us. And we're going to dive into some polls because before we started talking to you for two straight hours, we wanted to know a little bit about uh, who you are, where you're coming from. Um, so Joe, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the poll questions now. Um, so folks who are joining us, you shouldn't have to do anything. It should just pop up on your screen and you can answer these questions. Is there anyone who has not seen the poll questions? I do see results coming in, but I just want to make sure everybody sees the questions. All right, so we've got 75% have voted, oh, 83, and I realize that it might not be 100% because the presenters probably aren't voting right now. <laughs> so uh, we'll start talking about these. This is a big help to us, actually, um, because how we design our materials is going to depend a lot on how teachers are using them. Um, so it looks like we've got a pretty... Kate, if you want to wait just, I think it's just the 12 participants. We're waiting just on one more and then I can oh. end polling and gotcha. all of the results be put forward. So we'll give um, another 15 seconds. We're missing one voter from the group. I also know that sometimes technology gets in the way and sometimes people are stepping aside. So we won't 100% wait for that, but we'll give one, um, just one more moment for that last vote to come in. 
and then I will go ahead and post those publicly for everybody to see. Cue up the Jeopardy theme. If you are trying to vote and having any issues, you can send me a message. Otherwise, I'm going to close this out. All right, Kate, here are your results. Great. OK, so it looks like most folks are in a hybrid blended model. Um, we've got a few people who are going back completely in person, and um, we've got looks like at least one person who uh, doesn't know yet what the fall is going to look like. Um, so that is, you know, we figured we should be designing these materials pretty flexibly so that they work if you are trying to get materials to your students, um, but also if, if you're right there in the classroom with them. So it's good to know. Um, we've got, looks like everybody has some familiarity with using primary sources. Um, some folks, it's very much in their comfort zone or they're pretty confident with it. Um, some may want a little bit more experience, so that's great, that's why we're here today. And most people use these about, primary sources about once a month in their classroom, it looks like. Um, a few use them every day, every week, um, and a few, it looks like this will be the first time. Okay, for biggest obstacle, yeah, most people are having trouble finding the time. So we want to make these hopefully as seamless as possible so you can meet your existing requirements by using these. Um, but yeah, age appropriate resources is definitely why our team came together. So thank you. <laughs> we wanted to make it easier if we could. And all right. So thank you everybody for that. We did have one person indicate other as an mm -hmm. obstacle using primary sources. If you feel comfortable, if you could please give us a brief description um, as to what that other idea is in the chat box, that other reason. Uh, part, of the, uh, part of the rationale for gathering this information is to make sure that we are developing and supporting primary source use um, for educators. So if there's a barrier out there that we didn't think of, uh, we'd appreciate hearing from you. Absolutely. All right, so uh, just to give you a sense of what we're doing today, um, we are going to quickly be reviewing the materials we pulled together, um, and the bulk of the time today we'll actually be trying it out as a group. Um, we are giving you a chance to sort of experience what it would be like for your students. Um, I know it's kind of in a weird capacity over Zoom, but a lot of things are now, so thanks for bearing with us on that. Um, we are going to be breaking into smaller groups, so you'll really have the chance to share. Um, and I would like uh, folks to, I want to encourage people that once video, that's really helpful. It's, um, I know not everyone's comfortable doing it, but it is a way to feel like we're really in the same room together. And we do have a small enough group that we will be able to um, have everybody speak. Um, so at that point, you'll have the chance to unmute, um, share ideas, share opinions, things like that. Um, we're going to be going over logistical details just to make sure you know exactly how to find everything. Um, and all the links that we're sharing today, we will send out in a follow-up email to everybody who registered as well. To, uh, we're going to take a three-minute break um, at some point in here to give everyone the chance to grab a drink of water or whatever and come back in. Then we'll be moving into the final part of our day, which is another breakout room discussion. And this is where you'll have the chance to really share with each other um, ideas about what might work for your classroom, if you have any tips and tricks, if you have um, really specific detailed uh, things you'd like to know, um, we'll do that. And then we'll have a chance to hear from all of our panelists in a final Q&A. All right, so the materials we developed, you'll get to see them in a minute, but as just a big picture overview, every packet um, is themed around a certain question. Um, these are all about pandemics in Maine, as the title of the workshop suggested. Uh, this was something that we didn't know we were going to be focusing on a topic as a topic at the beginning of the year, but you know, for obvious reasons, it's on everybody's minds right now, and we wanted to create an opportunity to discuss this in classrooms. Um, we do recognize that this uh, can be a pretty triggering topic. You may have uh, you know, you yourself may have family members, your students may have family members who um, have been affected very personally by this. 
So we would encourage people um, to treat this with sensitivity. A lot of students might be really scared still, um, especially coming back uh, in person in the fall. So our hope anyway, is that these materials can be a way to kind of look at the history of this in Maine, how people have endured things in the past, talk about some of the issues that people dealt with back then that are absolutely being dealt with right now, um, because history really can be a helpful way to um, learn and prepare for the future and just get at these pretty important discussion topics. Um, so each of our questions around the history of pandemics um, includes an introductory document that's just a few written pages with some historical context, some information that you can present to your students. We do not expect you as a teacher to be an expert in the history of Maine pandemics because none of us were. Um, we dug pretty deeply to find the information that we did and our goal was to give you everything you need to go to your students, um, present them with some information. They're gonna have questions you can't answer because we can't answer them either, but this is at least a starting point um, for you to dive into this material. Um, each packet is mainly rooted around the sources. So that's where our collaborative team came in really handy because um, Maine Historical Society has stuff that we don't have at Maine State Museum and the library has stuff that they don't have at the archives. And we pulled everything that we could to try to create a pretty compelling group of documents, artifacts, um, images that your students could dig really deeply into and learn some bigger lessons. Um, each packet also has analysis worksheets. Um, teaching with primary sources is going to be new to some of the participants in this workshop. It's also going to be new to some of your students and it's not really an intuitive thing like to look at a lamp and what does this lamp tell you about 1920? Like it's sort of a, a hard thing to compute. So the worksheets are a way to break it down into step-by-step -step ways to gather information. Um, we have labels with info about the sources. Um, it seems weird to have this as a separate step because you walk into a museum and you see a painting and there's a label right next to it. But this is our way to make this a little bit more of a, a mystery activity to really encourage students to um, use their uh, eyes to dig really deeply and make educated guesses, make observations, inferences about these sources before we give them information about what it is, when it was made, who it was made by, all that stuff. Um, and then each packet also contains some optional activities and reflection questions. And this was our way to bring these conversations up to the present day. All right, so we are going to dive in right now. Um, Emma is the one who knows all of this best because she has been working hard all summer on creating these materials for you. So I'm gonna get out of this screen share for a second and get into another screen share. Do, do, do. And pull this up. All right, so um, what we're gonna be, we have two main topics that we've developed at this point. Um, I don't know if we've mentioned it yet in this workshop, but this is not a finished product. This is our way of trying to get you everything you need as soon as we can before the fall starts and you need the information. But um, this is a work in progress. So right now we have all of our information up in a Google Drive folder. Um, this that you see right now um, is going to be edited with input from this workshop today. It's going to be edited as we look at something and think, oh, you know, this could be a little bit better if we tweak it. Um, and there will also be more questions here. So we currently have um, two questions developed. We've got, how do people carry on with life during a pandemic? And we've got, is it right to control people's actions during a pandemic? So those are some big questions. Um, and out of these two today, we're just gonna be diving into carrying on with life during a pandemic. So I'm gonna bring up the introduction for this and Emma is going to take it away. Thanks Kate. Um, so yeah so I've been spending my summer uh, kind of helping to move the project along and developing or working off of what everyone else has already pulled together for these primary source sets. So I've been the one that's um, been trying to pull together stuff from online and from the different 
organizations to um, sort of compile introductions and labels that will make it easier for all of you um, teachers and students to sort of get your hands on the primary source documents. Um, so just to start off with a little introduction about this question, which is how do people carry on with daily life during pandemics? The idea of the introduction is that um, it would give you all information that you need to make the educated guesses about the sources. Um, and so for like the high school and middle school level, we, I wrote it under the assumption that students would likely be reading this, but you could also handle it any other way you could as teachers read this yourself and then sort of introduce whatever you think is relevant to your students. Um, we assumed with the elementary school level that probably students wouldn't be reading the introduction themselves, um, but theoretically they could. Um, we thought maybe you might read it out loud or again, introduce the material in whatever way you see fit. So we're trying to find the line between giving you all the information that you need to feel like an expert enough in the topics and not overwhelming you. Um, so hopefully we found it at least well enough. Um, so for the, for the daily life primary source set, we start out with just a summary of sort of the goal of the lesson, which is pretty basic. Um, you're going to look at primary source documents from tuberculosis and influenza pandemics to invest, investigate how people have carried on with life during historic pandemics. So there are five main historic pandemics that we talk about, which are smallpox, cholera, tuberculosis, influenza, and polio. I can't believe I didn't miss one. Um, but we kind of tried to pick either which pandemics spoke the best to a specific question or which pandemics do we have sources from that just were the most relevant. So like for this particular um, primary source that we're only talking about tuberculosis and influenza. So for the first part of the introduction, we're starting out, this is constant throughout all the different sets um, with what is a pandemic, just introduction to like what pandemics are, which I found helpful to write because I realized like, I don't really know exactly what qualifies a pandemic. Um, so I bet I'm not the only one in that position. Um, but I guess it turns out that a pandemic is um, basically a, a very a fast spreading infectious disease virus that, that spreads across the whole world. So something's called an epidemic when it's only in a community or region or country, but once it spreads across the entire world, it's a pandemic. Um, so we're trying to give you guys like vocabulary to talk about this. And at the middle school level, we actually include like a bulleted list of vocabulary that could be applicable to elementary or high school level too. Um, but we also talk about for, for vocab, um, things like what is a virus, um, which I think you all probably know, what is immunity? So when, when your body can sort of fight back against a virus because they've already encountered it a little bit, um, what is a vaccine? You know, a vaccine is a way to develop immunity before ever actually getting sick. So we try to sort of get age appropriate level definitions for those, those ideas. And we just give them an introduction of uh, like what would a pandemic have looked like for you? So you may have had to stay home from school. You may have known people that are sick, whatever. Um, and so what does this mean on a global scale? Like I said, um, here's what a pandemic is. Here's what a virus is. Things that you all probably know, but just introducing like first a virus starts in one place, then it becomes an outbreak and spreads and it becomes an epidemic as it spreads more. Um, and then just sort of talking about the way that um, as history has progressed, uh, pandemics have become less common. So like the further back you go, the more likely you would have been to be living through a pandemic. But at the same time, pandemics now, as we all know, can spread really, really fast because of the way that travel has changed. So medicine and sanitation have made it possible to stop pandemics more quickly or avoid them. At the same time, you know, pandemics can happen really fast and be really hard to stop at once right now. So sort of introducing those main themes and ideas. Um, and then we sort of transition to background about the specific diseases. Um, so for this particular primary source that we're talking about tuberculosis and influenza. So these will be listed in chronological order. Um, and there should be like an image with each one that kind of has some different clues and interesting things. So uh, the introduction about tuberculosis um, is just to say that tuberculosis was primarily um, a disease in the lungs. I mean, people might know this or might not. I didn't know it at all before I started doing this, but it um, was most rampant during the 1800s, 1900s. Um, and there's actually a lot of information on tuberculosis in Maine, which is really cool um, for us. And the main thing that we sort of focus on here are the use of sanatoriums. So sanatoriums were basically a way to isolate people with tuberculosis 
um, and try to stop them from infecting other people. So like right now, it would be like, it's basically a quarantine facility. Um, but they were often run by uh, state governments, not always, at some points they were private, sometimes they were more public. So that um, is kind of something that's worth noting. And we talk about the way that sanatoriums were meant to treat people with fresh air and sunlight. Um, there was the Western Maine Sanatorium, which we have some sources on. Um, and so we can kind of look specifically at that sanatorium to see what did people eat there? Um, why did they leave? What images do we have of the space? Um, how many people died? How many people couldn't afford it? Um, so there's a lot of class sort of stuff associated with sanatoriums, which is hinted at here where we say when the state government ran the Western Maine Sanatorium, they limited patient bills so that it was more accessible. But at the same time, just like any medical care now, if you have more money, you can get better, more comfortable medical care in most, in most uh, cases. So that was definitely applicable to sanatoriums as well. Um, and some of our other primary source sets, I think you're gonna focus more on identity, but that still comes up with you know, daily life. How, how much could, did people have to maintain their daily life because they had to keep working through having TB versus could go to a sanatorium and take three months off work to receive treatment. Um, so that's sort of the tuberculosis introduction. And then Spanish flu, I think is coming up a lot more in the news now because it's the most kind of similar to COVID in a lot of ways. Um, it was a really fast spreading pandemic. It spread in 1818, I mean, sorry, 1918, 1919, um, and was sort of like a strain of the, of the flu virus that we have now that just spread really, really quickly and became really deadly. Um, and it also spread during World War I, which is important because that meant a lot of people were in close quarters and people from different countries and different regions of the world. So it's known for spreading um, throughout, through like soldiers and other sort of war related activities. Um, it's interesting, I think that this image up on the right has like a thing of how to make a mask, which I know like we were all seeing at the beginning of COVID and still are. So there's definitely a lot of like resources around masking, um, which, you know, history repeats itself. That's a good, a good example of that. Um, and one thing about the Spanish flu that's often talked about is that it came in three waves. So the first wave was most mild, um, mostly impacted vulnerable people, but the second and third waves um, were much more deadly and much more deadly to young adults in particular. Um, so people like myself in the first wave might have been like, you know, kind of the way I am now, you know, it's important to be to be careful and cautious, but at the same time, I'm I'm at a lower risk of this disease really hurting me. And and in this case, the virus mutated, and then the second and third waves would have been equally deadly to pretty much anyone and was really, really scary. Um, people could as it says at the bottom of this, people could die within hours or days um, from their skin would turn blue and they would suffocate, which is like really, really scary. Um, so sort of the main thing on that is just that it, it had these different waves, it moved really quickly, it ended pretty quickly, and that it moved through um, war-related activities in particular. So basically, you would probably introduce that to your students or you would have them read this themselves, um, and hopefully it's in, uh, language that's appropriate for the grade level that you're teaching. So we have it sort of this language fine tuned for then the lower grades and then the lower, lower grades. So for middle school and elementary school, we started with the highest level and then refined it. Um, and this shouldn't give that much information about the actual question. It's more just giving you background that you would need to then look at the sources. So we kind of introduce like, okay, so then think about who, what, when, why, and how, or, um, you know, you, you carry on with your life so have other people um, during these pandemics. So introducing that. Um, and then after you'd introduce this, you would then be moving on to the sources themselves, which is what we're gonna do and the labels. Um, and then we also include kind of a closing, some closing resources. So the first is each set includes like an optional activity that is a little more like interactive. Um, for this, we say, you know, the idea is like plan out a museum exhibit about your life during coronavirus. Um, I think that's really interesting in thinking about what are the artifacts that I would be wanting to like preserve or show um, if my life was being represented, which is kind of a way to start thinking about how do historical exhibits get created um, and how, you know, do like real people really live their lives and then we kind of select these specific things and use them to represent the way that their life happened during pandemics. So we have that and then also some reflection questions, which you would probably 
want to facilitate with your class or have, have people discuss in small groups or even write out. Um, so, you know, they're pretty basic, but also really helpful to just think about themes, you know, how do pandemics change your daily routine? How do young people deal with pandemics? Um, like closer to the bottom, how do things like modern travel and technology make pandemics easier or harder to deal with so they get more complex? Um, so all the different sources or all the different sets will have an activity and reflection questions that are associated with that specific set. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the introduction and hopefully you all now know a little bit about tuberculosis and influenza enough to look at some sources from those pandemics and start thinking about how did people go on with their daily lives during those time periods. Great, thank you so much, Emma. Um, all right, so we're gonna dive into our breakout rooms right now. Um, don't worry, we're not just sending you off on your own. Each group will have a few facilitators um, from our panel and we will meet you back. Uh, we're taking 20 minutes for this activity. Um, again, please turn on your video camera if you're comfortable. We'll be having a discussion and then coming back uh, 20 minutes. So let's see, that would be 2.05 um, will be pulled back together and you'll get a reminder um, that that's about to happen. So everyone, just so you know, the um, high school group is gonna remain in this main room so that we can continue to record a conversation and see what this looks like. So just so you're aware. So I'm gonna open up the record, uh, the breakout rooms. There'll be a room for elementary um, and a room for middle school. And again, if you've indicated as a high school, you will not see anything. So don't worry, you'll just remain in this room. And you should see a button to join right now. All right, it looks like we've got one middle school person left, Alicia or Alicia. That's my fault. I did not assign her. I thought everybody joined. Oh. Hold on, Alicia. <laughs> I'm gonna go check in on the rooms and you can go ahead and begin, Kate. Sounds good. All right, hi, high school group. This is pretty. Um, kind of putting it all together. You see, this is the introduction um, that that is very similar to the high school introduction that Emma just went through. We won't go through it, but you can see it's, a, it's very similar. Um, she, six sources, so I'll just like show them super quick and then we can choose which one we wanna focus on. So we have this image. We have this image. Another image of some of how long things lasted. All right, so we're gonna dive into how did people carry on with life during a pandemic and go into the ninth through 12th grade folder here. Um, so once you get into the folder, you're going to see the introduction. That's what we just went through together as a full group. And um, the labels, which we're not going to look at until the very end of the activity. So um, for now, we, uh, I've got some worksheets pulled up already in these two tabs here, ready to go. And we'll get right into our sources. So again, the question is, how do people carry on with daily life during a pandemic? And this is a little bit of audience participation. So we get to decide as a group which source we want to dive into first. We might have time for more than one. Um, so as I scroll through these, see if anything catches your fancy. Mm. 
Okay, there's one. Whoops. This is a two pager. And the last one. All right, do I have any requests about ones you want to look at a little bit more closely? I like them all. The second one kind of caught my eye with the horse. I was trying to make sure it was <laughs> really a horse. Yeah, let's, uh, I thought this one might end up being a little bit mysterious. Um, yeah. So I'm going to open that in a new window, get it a little bit bigger. Okay, maybe if I can zoom in a bit. So let's take a moment just to look at this picture together. Anyone want to take a stab at what we're seeing here? <laughs> well, it looks like a parade of children, mostly children. It's like a pantomime horse. Yeah, it's not real. Yeah, over here we've got something yeah. going on. <laughs> That's what caught my eye. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is pretty eye-catching. All right, let's... um. Let's keep looking at the photo, but I'm going to pull up our image analysis worksheet here. Get out of full screen. And we're just going to see if we can. Whoa, I don't know how I got my computer to do that. All right, so we're going to see if we can answer some of these questions. So to start out, what kind of image is it? From these options and I apologize if it seems like I'm uh, asking easy questions to you right now but we're doing a little school role play here so <laughs> is it photograph photograph yeah all right oops uh oh I think my computer is freezing up oh well we could at least answer the questions verbally if not type it in. Um, sometimes my internet connection goes a little bit sour and it looks like it's doing it right now. Um, so is this a black and white image or color? Black and white. We've got black and white. All right, and Kathleen, you're welcome to get on, in on the mix here too. Um, three things you notice in the image. Now we've already mentioned um, it looks like a parade. We've mentioned that there's some kind of pantomime animal here. Um, so the idea this isn't real. Oh. But probably cool. <laughs> I just noticed another part of that animal. <laughs> oh, what's that? The trunk. It's a trunk off the front, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not a horse. I'm guessing it's an elephant. <laughs> Maybe we've got an elephant here. Either that or I don't, I don't know, but I see. It looks like a trunk in the front. Yeah, or a horse eating a huge carrot. One or the yeah, other. Yeah, that's the other thing. I wonder if I can zoom in any more. Actually, oh, yeah. yeah. So let's take a 
slide through these folks. So we've got kids back there. All right, anything else that we notice? Hats. They all have hats on. Most of them have hats on. Mm -hmm. It does seem like everyone's in hats, yeah. Head covering of some sort. Mm -hmm. There are leaves on the trees, so I think that it's not winter. Yeah, maybe a summertime scene. Yeah. All right, so yeah, we've, we've definitely got at least three things we're noticing here. Um, so we know there are people, and you've already described the people a little bit. You've mentioned that they, these seem to be children. Um, that they're wearing hats. Yeah. Anything else about them? Like a almost gender bending makeup. Yeah, there does seem to be some makeup on here. So we don't really, I guess, know whether these are boys or girls, but we do have definitely some uh, goatees that probably are not natural. <laughs> yeah. There's um, caps. You might imagine there's long hair stuffed up in them. Oh, yeah, maybe hiding the long hair. Yeah. Let's look at the group in the back. And it does look like, actually, I hadn't noticed this before, but zoomed in, it looks like we've got some other stuff coming up on the background. Okay, um, what about the, any things or objects we see here? Do we have any buildings or animals, plants, man-made things? Well, we mentioned, you mentioned the trees and mm -hmm. the man-made elephant or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Some kind of costume there, yeah. Yeah. Looks like mostly people. I don't really, unless they're way back in there, I don't see any buildings or... Yeah, I don't really either. It's kind of actual open, animals. Maybe an open horizon back there. And they're not really... They seem to be holding hands, but they're not really holding, well, that might be a sign or something, but. Is there a caption or title? So we have a caption. Um, all, the, all the sources will have something like this, and I know that um, I've heard that students sometimes get confused about whether this is like a part of the source or not, but you can, I mean, just clarify like it's not part of the source um maybe that, that might be at a younger level um but so we have central Maine sanatorium women's ward I teach i well i'm an ed tech oh okay so, yep so i work with grades one through six wow yeah and i do pull out and push in services so okay. yeah all right, um, scroll down a little bit. So do we know for sure what the date is? And so I'm seeing some no's. All right, but so we don't know. So we're going down here to know, but it may have been around this year or a time period. And this could be a total guess, but use any clues that you see. Well, we know it's after photography was invented, but maybe not before color photography. So that might mm -hmm. help narrow it down a little bit. Yep. Especially for someone who knows more about photography dates than I do. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know when color photography became a thing. I mean, photography in its earliest format is like around 1840. Um, when we started seeing color photography, I don't know, but I think we'd have to maybe make a best guess based on like what people are wearing. Yeah, it's a little hard too with costumes, but yeah, I don't know. Do these outfits remind you folks of any specific time period? I know they are costumes, but still got some shoes and hats that they probably borrowed from their parents. Or... Well, it looks like knickers, but I don't know if that's just totally because they're in costume or... Yeah. Yeah, a few of them have shorter yeah. pants. Some of them. Can you go beyond the beginning of the parade, the beginning of it? 
what is that white thing way in the back by the trees? Looks like a propane gas tank. <laughs> yeah, that or maybe a bench or something or. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that could be a good clue. That would be kind of, I don't think they, it depends. I don't know if they had those back then or not or yep. whenever it was. Oh, we got our five minute warning, but I think we're doing well. Yeah, it'd be handy if we had some kind of vehicle or something like that in here, but, but I don't, I, my, my guess looking at this without knowing too much about it is maybe early 1900s. Any, does that sound all right to folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, put it in like somewhere between 1915, 1925. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So we've got a rough guess. Um, no caption or title. We, we haven't seen any words anywhere on this picture unless I've missed them. So it looks like a, a hair or a crack in there. <laughs> um, do we know who made the image? No. Um, what about guesses about what kind of person might have taken this photo? Mm. Maybe someone's parent, you know, if these are all kids, did did a parent snap a photo, you know, a photograph? Yeah, I like that, Kathleen, because I'm thinking, like, this doesn't really look like a professional photographer, right? Like, yeah. really capture, you know, there's candid and it feels, you know, amateurish, I guess. Yeah, maybe a parent, probably someone who knows the kids in some way. This is not, you know, breaking news probably that these kids are walking through a field. So this seems like a pretty personal photo. Yeah. Okay. Um, we don't have any clues about where the image is located um, or where it was made. Sometimes a photo will have the photography studio on it, but we don't have that. Um, but if we had to guess what, what kind of place, what kind of location this may have been, what do we have? field yeah we've got a field it feels kind of rural mm -hmm. it doesn't I don't, you know it's a parade in the middle of a field like as opposed to down the main street in town or mm -hmm. but, you know no no sign of like again like buildings anywhere I don't know if again it's hard to see if there's like a, if that's like a lamp post in the background up against one of the trees or. Oh. Really Whoa. Yeah, it looks like it is. Wow. So maybe not as rural as I thought. <laughs> maybe some kind of park, yeah. But we don't, I mean, there aren't too many parks where you can't see any buildings in the background, right? Yeah. And we do have, I don't know if this is staining or maybe a mountain in the distance. So we at least know if this is a town, it's a town that's not too built up. Um, we've got kind of a clue that this is Maine just because we're the main organization sharing it with you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a part of Maine that's fairly flat, right? Um, okay. All right, so we have gone through a lot of, a lot of things here um, from this mysterious image. Um, we don't know exactly what's going on, but reviewing everything that we've noted so far, what can this tell you about the time period in which it was created? We've got one minute left. It's a time when parades are a thing, mm -hmm. which I guess doesn't really narrow it down very much, but if we're thinking about how do people try to go on with daily life, like, well, if maybe an official parade was canceled, so there was a makeshift parade of some kind with, you know, the school kids or something or a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like, um, go ahead. 
I was just gonna say, I like the circus theme, what that I think it was Lauren, you said the um, circus coming to town. When I was uh, like seven, eight, nine, I lived in Thomaston and we always had a circus. It wasn't Burnham and Bailey, but a circus came every year and set up. So I don't know, I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it's a funky ele elephant. <laughs> so that's kind of a neat thing that, you know, obviously this is a pretty different time period than we're in right now, but there are things in here that remind you of your childhood, you know? Yeah. Still, still ha finding ways to have fun and, and be a little goofy, make some excitement, some entertainment. Which also might mean that this is a, uh, you know, if if things are really dire, if you're in the middle of a war-torn country or something like that, you probably wouldn't have a scene like this. So there may be some clues about, you know, either people distracting themselves from tough stuff going on or um, some signs of, uh, you know, this this isn't about the basics of food and shelter and safety. This is a little bit extra that you you do because you can. Great. Well, I think we'll probably be joined pretty soon by the rest of the group. I'm going to close out this and stop my screen share. Oh, everybody else is already here. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we'll wait for um, other folks to file back in. I did get a note from a couple people who had to head out early. Um, Kate, so everybody is back. Oh, everyone is back. Great. Yeah, and I'm thinking actually based on numbers, we may want to just do one breakout room as the final discussion, which is good to know because some folks had family things come up. I was thinking the exact same thing, so good. Great. All right, so um, at this point, we want to uh, give people a chance to sort of process what we just did. Um, I know facilitators in each of our group groups took some um, quick notes. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, we'll go three to five, six to eight, then nine to 12 last. Um, and when, why don't you start by telling me what source you had and I'll pull it up so we can see it on the screen together while we're talking about it. All right, so um, group three to five, please. Yeah, so we, I can start. We pulled up uh, the image of uh, the parade. I can't, I don't have it opened. Yes, that's the one. Um, and so we, went through the analysis worksheet that um, led us through just the, and the idea behind the analysis worksheet is to kind of guide us through just, you know, teaching the students in terms of um, just spirit of inquiry and, and just observation and try to bring out um, some kind of reflections on what they see. Um, so this was um, the photo that we picked. Um, we also, after we were done, um, we went in and looked at the label. This was actually a picture of um, a 4th of July parade at one of the sanatoriums. It was from the 1920s, um, 29 to be exact. Um, just like when we looked at this uh, image as uh, collaborators, <laughs> all the staff, um, even in our breakout session, the same thing, you know, it was some of the same questions came out as to what are we actually looking at? And, um, you know, looked at the time of, time of day, time of the season, it could have been, um, what were the activities they were actually doing? Um, so, uh, so kind of, the, you know, Going back and looking at the label, I don't know if Joanna, you want to add any more into that, but um, going back and look at the label, it was kind of fun to just see how close we were in actually identifying what might have been going on. Um, and just that, you know, the power of imagination in, in terms of even what this creature is in the, in the forefront there um, and the ages of the the people in the, in the photograph. Um, and kind of the takeaway too was, you know, it's, um, once you knew that it was from the sanatorium and it was the 4th of July parade and whatever, it kind of could lead into a discussion as to, you know, what was daily life like for the people that were there. And this could be an example of an activity that uh, for those that were feeling 
better um, or able to, you know, play and enjoy themselves. Um, so I don't know, Joanna, do you want to add anything else? I think, um, you know, we tried to also talk about how this would um, particular activity and using the worksheets and, and looking at these images um, would play with a um, elementary grade level, um, which is much different than our middle school and high school um, uh, students and, and giving some some tips about how to to kind of work with these images and, and the fact that we chose these images um, for for that age level. So I think that was part of our conversation as well. Thank you. And also thanks to this group because I forgot to share the source label with my group. So they're probably hearing this like, what? We didn't get the answers. So <laughs> <laughs> we almost did. We were running out of time. But all right. So uh, group two, um, that's six to eight. Can you tell me which source you chose? Sure. Um, we chose source number six, which was the image of the um, outdoor porch with the beds. Okay, let's pull that up. And you can talk while I'm pulling it up if you'd like. Sure. So um, people had some pretty thoughtful observations. Um, some thought it was like, you know, maybe it's an outdoor garage. Uh, one thing that was noted was um, the caretakers seem to be all female. Um, wondering why there was a patient, one patient indoors uh, and why everybody else was outside. Um, the lack of social distancing uh, with a group of ladies uh, in the background. And also a question about um, the patient in the foreground uh, that is laying in bed on her stomach, um, is that a, was that a way to treat tuberculosis? Um, did it allow for better breathing? Um, so, and then uh, the group also noticed that the building looked rather remote. There wasn't much in the background. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Um, there was a comment, uh, people liked how the worksheet was, was specific and guiding um, to encourage some more thoughtful um, observations and reflections on the image. Um, Brittany, do you wanna talk about the conclusions? Sure, um, so after uh, some great discussion about the image and going through the analysis worksheet, um, we did have a chance to read through the label um, and, uh, or but before reading through the label, sorry, the conclusions were um, there must have been isolation between men and women since everyone in this image seemed to be women. We saw from the label that it was the women's ward. Um, being outdoors was probably a primary treatment at this time. Uh, the pandemic was deadly enough that we had to separate um, people who had tuberculosis and possibly fatigue was something associated with the illness um, based on um, how people looked in, in the image. And then after reading through the label, um, some things that were surprising were the idea of civic duty uh, came up and just thinking about how now we think of wearing a mask as our civic duty um, and yet it's not something that everyone necessarily complies with. Was that something that was felt at the same time um, while people were living through tuberculosis? Um, and surprised by the date of the epidemic, when we were reading that this was an image from the um, mid 1910s, this was right before the influenza pandemic hit in 1918. So wow. talking about the overlap of pandemics in the early 20th century and um, the, you know, the, the strain of um, overlapping with influenza, tuberculosis and polio. Um, so it could definitely be some um, additional thoughtful reflection on the difference between that period and what we're living through now. Great, thank you. Thank you, group two. All right, and uh, so our final group, the high school group, did also choose the parade image as well. Um, but Kathleen, is there uh, anything in your notes that um, stood out from what's already been covered? Um, we saw, I think, a lot of the, the same things that the first group saw. This was a parade, was our, our guests made up mostly of children. 
Um, again, a lot of talk about what that that creature might be that's sort of towards the center of the image. I think we finally landed on it was probably some kind of elephant. Maybe this is recreating a, a circus parade. Um, we looked closely at like the costumes. It looked like some of the children were, you know, even had makeup on, like little, like some um, pretend facial hair. Um, thought a lot about where this might be. We couldn't see any buildings in in the picture. So maybe this is in a, a park or someplace rural, someplace very isolated. Um, as you indicated, we didn't really talk, um, we didn't get a chance to talk about the label. Um, but I think we made a lot of those similar observations. I think we also guessed this was probably somewhere around like 1915-ish, like just based on the elements of the photograph. Um, what everybody's wearing. And we speculated too that this was probably like a, like an amateur photographer, um, maybe one of the parents of the kids that are in this parade, but we weren't really sure. All right, thank you. Great. Um, so what we're going to do now, I want to give everyone the chance to have just a three minute break. Um, so around 2.18, if we could come back together, um, I would encourage you just to keep Zoom up, but you can maybe mute yourself, turn off your video, whatever you need to do, and we'll meet back shortly. Thanks. Okay, welcome back, folks. Um, so we wanted to make sure you know how to find this stuff. We will be sending out a Google Drive link to everyone who participated in this session, um, anyone who registered. And at some point down the road, once we get it all polished up, um, make final changes, add in our additional questions, um, we are going to post a, um, be posting this on a website. So it'll be a little bit prettier than what you see now. We thank you for being patient and kind of testing this beta version with us. So if you follow this link, and Emma, I am going to put you slightly on the spot. I'm going to give you a second if you can remember. Um, I realized it'd be fun to share the other questions with people because we have two developed. Um, so give me a thumbs up when you have what they are. One is um, how do different, how do pandemics affect different people in different ways? And that one is mostly talking about identity and like vulnerable populations. So talking about within each pandemic, I think we talk about all the pandemics at the high school level, um, focusing on like gender, race, class, immigration status that sort of thing. And then the other one is, um, oh, uh, where do people get their information? Yes. So where do people get their information about um, pandemics? So we're talking about, yeah, sources of information um, that we use, like kind of talks about um, like newspaper and more like government based documents, but also um, communication between people. Um, so like letters and stuff like that. Great. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so once you get the link, you'll be popped into this folder here. Um, I realized something I didn't mention before, Emma made some beautiful charts with big picture views of the epidemics we're talking about. So if you wanna be like, okay, polio, spinal cord infection, uh, cholera, vomiting, like things like that, you get the big picture view of it. Um, and then we also have this timeline here so you can see where some of these um, pandemics line up between the local and global level um, over time as well as the span of them. So that's a fun resource to have. Um, and I'm just going to duck quickly into the controlling actions because we haven't had a chance to look at that. So when you open up the folder, you will choose your grade level. Let's hop into six to eight. Um, your analysis worksheets are going to be here. Um, you will want to download these. If you open up a preview, you are not able to fill this in um, because we do know that some people will be sharing this virtually. So these PDFs, um, you can fill them out on your computer and a student could save them and submit them that way. Um, or you can print it and submit a physical copy. So just remember, if you do want to use that fillable online version, uh, download them first. Um, we've got our introduction for each, and we have got our labels for each. Um, so specifically in controlling actions, um, we didn't 
review this today. This is a much more document-based one. Um, whoops. We try to always mix in some images and artifacts, but the historic record is um, pretty scarce for some of these things in Maine, even with our agencies. So this had, um, this kind of has a lot of ethical um, issues that are brought up. So we've got some records from Orrington, Maine about how much the town reimbursed people for their goods that were burnt um, because they were exposed to smallpox. We've got uh, this is an actual um, legislative document with information on the town selectmen's authority and being able to keep sick people out of the town, things like that. We've got um, a, this is really one of my favorites actually. Um, students can be kind of turned off by the heavy text things, but um, if they dive in, um, this is a petition that was put out to reimburse um, somebody uh, $46.46 in addition to uh, $10.80 um, because he personally stopped a group of people who are trying to tra uh, travel from Quebec into Maine. Um, and cholera, had, there was a cholera outbreak in Quebec at the time. So he went through and turned back people and posted notices, which is a really fascinating discussion about, you know, you can talk about, you know, immigration, uh, anti-immigrant sentiments. You can talk about um, control over who gets to travel where, when, all that kind of stuff. This is a great source. We've got our favorite, we've already seen, the, the women's ward in one of the main sanatoriums. Um, we have records on how long patients stayed in the sanatorium and specifically um, the reasons that they left, even though their doctor advised them not to, which is interesting to think about. And the final one here is an actual smallpox vaccine that we have at the Maine State Museum. Okay, so that gives you an overview of that. Um, and I want to also, oh, we already took our break, um, let you know we do have some further resources. If you like this model of primary source learning, um, Maine State Museum's website has a whole bunch of materials that were just developed um, with folks in this collaboration. Um, this past spring around, around Maine's bicentennial. So the themes that we have there are creating a Maine identity, mapping Maine, the power of Maine's vote, slavery in Maine, which I wanna do a shout out to Emma because she was a student at Bates at the time of this and um, studying uh, the connection between Bates College and um, profits from uh, the system of slavery, and she did some editing for us on that one, and um, the effect of Maine statehood on Wabanaki peoples. So if what you've looked at today seems interesting, feel free to check these out. Same deal, they've got photos, artifacts, well, not all photos, but <laughs> this was a long time ago, but images, artifacts, um, and documents around that. And uh, a quick plug to Maine Historical Society, um, for all of their wonderful lesson plans. They have done a ton on the bicentennial um, and they've got this handy system here where you can go in, indicate your grade level, if you have a specific content area um, and there's a drop down to choose which theme you want to look at here. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out the stuff they have on the bicentennial and, and all, all aspects of Maine history. Um, also their main memory network is my go-to place to find primary sources in Maine. All right, great. So um, our last big part of today, uh, ignore the part that says breakout group because we're gonna stay in one big group here. Um, and we're gonna look at, um, just kind of talk about what we experienced in those rooms. Think about how they might translate to your classrooms. Um, we know, especially this fall, there's gonna to need to be a lot of flexibility built into this. Um, we tried to make our materials adaptable. So if you are thinking to yourself, oh, you know, my students really aren't gonna be comfortable reading that introduction. So what I'm gonna do is give them a quick presentation or maybe I'm gonna find a video to show them something else. 
they're going to read part of a book and then we'll bring in these sources in that way. Um, feel free to bounce those ideas off the group right now because we would love to have today's participants learn from each other. Um, we are not the classroom experts, you folks are. So um, this is a great opportunity to um, share some tips with other folks who are here today. All right, uh, so I'm gonna paste these we're gonna paste these questions, whoops, as I go through the entire presentation. We're gonna paste these questions in the chat so you have them up and I'm gonna bring it up so we can just see all of each other's faces. Um, if you would like to see everybody at once at the top right of your Zoom screen, you can swap between speaker view and gallery view. I'd recommend gallery view for this. And uh, if you have a comment, um, feel free to unmute yourself uh, you're also welcome to kind of raise your hand and I will call on you to jump in. All right. So first question is, yeah, what, what challenges do you think your classes might run into using these materials? You can also type them up in the chat box. All right, uh, Marie, I see you've got your hand up. So, I mean, a normal challenge that we would have in class is kids of different ability levels and something I'm really struggling with right now, my school district is going all in, we're all kids every day. So how do I group those kids so they're still socially distanced so they can have a reader, the kids who need a reader or, you know, pair partners or kids who are independent. So that's something I'm struggling with overall is how to differentiate in the way we already know how in this new situation. Yeah, thank you, Marie. And we did, um, when we were doing a pilot of our bicentennial materials in the classrooms, we did work in small groups. So every group had a printout of each one of the sources and they could choose the one they want. I know it's not a perfect solution, but that does mean that if there's a kid who's less comfortable with reading, they can maybe choose one of the images um, to work with. Um, and then we did have uh, in classrooms we worked with, sometimes there would be like a teacher's aide there helping out folks, but obviously that's different um, school by school. Uh, any of the other teachers have suggestions for working with different ability levels or people on our panel for that matter? I'm worried about this as well because we are supposed to keep students three feet apart and adults six feet apart from the students. Um, I like to put things on the wall around my classroom and we're only going to be half, like I'm only going to have 10 students in my room. So I would be able to have like pairs still three feet apart, but looking at something on the wall. But if you have more people in a room, that will make it a little more difficult. But I like, like I said, putting things up on the wall and having the kids like move around. But. Mm -hmm. I know when we were prototyping and actually going into the classroom for our bicentennial materials right before the pandemic and everything shut down, um, I was really impressed in how the student, the teachers were kind of very careful about the groups that they were putting together of students so that it was really balanced. Um, but we also, and, and I, this will differ from school to school, um, there were times where we really rearranged the classroom um, space itself. Uh, to, to make that work and, and using the walls, like you said, I think was is a really good idea. Um, and, you know, maybe there's um, a way of, of having that material on the wall where there's only one person in front of it at a time that's making comments on it and then building upon the, the students comments that are that are happening. Um, and, you know, maybe there's there's ways to do this more visually with our comments. I know in some of the worksheets we try to put like, you know, um, little icons, that, you know, if you have a watermark on there, you know, and, and maybe there's a way that we could um, work with that too, where there's, they're putting down icons that are indicating what they're observing rather than just um, writing it down um, and, and adding that to a presentation. You know, if they see a landscape for the parade picture, there's like a little landscape icon or they're, you know, doing those worksheets in a more visual way. Yeah. Not that they could also circle things versus writing down what they saw. They could just circle the things and then be able to verbally talk about it on a printout, maybe. Yeah, that seems like a great idea. I wonder too about, um, you know, because of the format of today's webinar, we weren't really 
you know, it wasn't like each one of us was filling out a worksheet on our own. Do you think that the format of maybe you project if you've got a projector or um, some folks have TV screens, so show the image up there and maybe as a class work through it together? I know that some some students in the class are the ones who always have their hands up, so you'd want to find a way to make sure that uh, everybody's involved, but um, that might be a possibility as well. Yep, Lauren? Yeah, I was wondering if I didn't get a chance to look at the, um, like, the aid for analyzing the uh, written sources that you have developed. Uh, I thought that your visual source analysis worksheet was really great, um, but I was just hoping that you could, like, maybe tell us a little bit about that because what I found in, again, I'm in high school, what I found that has worked really well with differenti differentiating sources without necessarily going through and changing the language of the source is um, that sort of like uh, guided notes almost. In, in the margins, you have like guided questions that say like, okay, indicating something's really interesting here and here's a leading question. What is so interesting about this huge block of text? Um, that's just like, a lot more interactive and then you can adjust the marginalia um, for different levels of students. So a student who needs a lot of support, you can have basically fill in the blank stuff and a student who needs less, they can do their own marginalia. Yeah, that sounds like a really great way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because especially I would say um, these themes do have some pretty text heavy topics. Um, we sometimes erred on the side of like providing more than people might want to use rather than less. But that does mean that I know that that can be a barrier when a student sees that big chunk of, of writing, uh, they do not want to dive into it. Yeah, so anything we can do to break that apart is helpful. Um, Joe, I see you've been sharing a couple things in the chat. Do you want to mention what they are? Sure, the first one um, is a website called Rewordify that at the top of the site, there's a yellow box that you can copy and paste anything into, and then it will rewordify it to different levels. So there was the question about um, different reading levels, and there was just the comment about some of the text heavy pieces. And so I would suggest, um, there was the first piece about, piece about if you, somebody had said, if you use the visuals, then the reading levels don't come in, um, which is a great piece. Uh, the text pieces, I would, highly suggest going through and saying, okay, we're going to read this piece and then rewordify it at different levels. And it's still that, that piece, I would say about 25, 20 plus years ago, there was the question about if you're dealing with primary sources, are you allowed to change it at all? And I think for the most part, especially in education, the idea is yes, we have to make the text accessible. That's the main point. And so I love Rewordify as a piece that you can have kids at all sorts of reading levels still interacting with that same basic text to still work their way along. Um, and the second link is to the Colorado Department of Education. My colleague in Colorado, Stephanie Hartman, worked with um, her state organizations years ago. She was part of the inspiration for why we have this now um, here in Maine. And they have, um, and somebody had said, talking about like circling odds and ends, if you look on that site, they have pieces, what I linked on the right hand side, you see primary source analysis worksheets and they made them for elementary schools. So if you do, um, like if I bring up the artifact one, it's um, what is the object made of? Circle all that apply and it's bone, paper, rock, wood. So it is that circling piece, again, that different level. Uh, what this group has created is a fantastic piece. Um, there's other ones, the Library of Congress and the archives has an elementary and a secondary. Um, so just look for those pieces out there. There isn't one answer to necessarily addressing and working with um, of these, working with these type of resources. And so if your students need a different level than the one that we've created here, then this is another one you could be using. Um, and then the other piece I was trying to find that I could not find the, the link in time um, is there's a gentleman by the name of Glenn Weeby in Kansas and I've seen him do trainings. He does this great piece um, where you frame an image and it's about asking what the kids are focusing on. So you take two L-shaped pieces of paper like a picture frame 
and then, but you can size them up, you can squeeze them down, you can open them up to different levels. And you could just say something like frame out the first thing that catches your attention. And then they narrow down and they're focusing on that. And that's for each individual student to determine um, what they're doing, right? So it's not a right answer type thing. So I could just say, Allison, what did you frame out? Why did that catch your attention? Alicia, what did you frame out? Okay, so now the next question is, like, where do you think you're supposed to be looking? And right, you can set up those questions. Um, and again, interacting with that visual uh, in a way that's meaningful for each student that there again, there isn't that right answer, but then I'm wanting them to talk about what was going on in their head. And I'm going to see if I can find his article where he talks about that. That's great, Joe. Thank you. And I, I have a follow up question on rewordify for you, Joe. Is that something that you would recommend students do on their own? They actually go through the process of using that tool? Or is that something that when we present a written document, we have it pre rewordified uh, as an option along with the transcription? I would have them pre rewordified copy paste in the text that you know that you are going to want to use um, and then have that at the different levels. And if you want to know a little bit more, um, I led a webinar this spring. It was actually the first of all of the ones that I did outside of the state organizations. It was tools to differentiate reading of primary sources and current events. And I start with walking through all the tools um, from Rewordify are included in that webinar. Great, thank you. All right, so do we have any other responses to that first question? Um, what challenges do you think your classes might run into? Uh, yes, Danielle. I was thinking um, they might have a hard time. If I, So we're hybrid and I might want them to do that worksheet at home and it would just be hard to print and send it home with them because maybe all the kids aren't there and then it would be hard for them to, I think, downloading and then uploading again is like a process for middle school students. So I was thinking I could turn it into a Google uh, form. That makes it a lot easier for then me to see all their answers and for them to use because they're familiar with that. They're not as familiar with downloading a, a PDF. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a great thing to be able to do. Yeah. And are you using um, Google Classroom with them or some other tool? Yeah, we do Google Classroom. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on that first question? Right. Oh, I see a hand up from Kyle. Yeah, uh, I was I was the one who in the, the original poll question said I didn't know what our school was doing because I'm in Millinocket and we have a uh, sudden outbreak up here. Um, oh. So um, most likely, I would guess that we will be starting the year virtual, and we have no idea how long that will, will last. And um, so just trying to figure out how I teach seventh and eighth grade, and um, the seventh graders that I want to teach and use more of these documents with, and I, I think it wouldn't be a bad way to kind of start the year, um, but just trying to figure out how to teach them virtually when I won't have a chance to get to know them first in person. I mean, this is the first time that I'll ever have a class that that I haven't actually seen in person before I start teaching them and, and kind of some thinking of strategies of, of how to um, how to do that. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, and I'm wondering, too, if uh, one thing I like to do when I'm actually in a classroom is sort of start out with some practice um, that can be a little bit maybe goofy, a little bit of an icebreaker, uh, like you share, uh, like Joanna, we had that class where we had them analyze a minion poster that was up on the wall and I had them like tell me what this creature was if I'd never heard of it before. So they were describing like, I was like, oh, well, he's wearing pants. Is he like some kind of construction worker or something? Like what's so I would say um, if you are using something like Google Classroom or if you have a way it's a little bit more interactive where students can comment on something that's right up there on the screen and see each other's comments, um, this, that could be a good introductory thing, like to have them really point out, yeah, like 
kind of a, a virtual version of, of what Joe was talking about with that framing activity. Like what's one thing you notice? Um, have them be a little bit creative, a little bit goofy. Um, could be a good way to dive into it. Um, you can do that with artifacts as well. Um, like look around your house and maybe you've got a bowling trophy that you put up, uh, something like that. With, with documents, students kind of seem to have a little bit more trouble getting creative about it in a way because they're used to getting reading assignments and getting quizzed on them. But um, maybe that's, that's one way to sort of tie this into your getting to know your class process. And, and it's also great practice because as goofy as it is, they are learning to look really closely for details and clues on things. I would say um, that this is going to sound easier than maybe it should, but I really think it's that shift in social studies education that's really important is that I think we oftentimes should start our year in social studies without any content, without diving into some of that piece. And I remember my previous position working with a teacher, coaching a teacher, and they'd said, well, if I'm going to do this right, I need to spend the first weeks just practicing all this stuff. And I said, do it then. Well, I can't waste two. I'm like, it's not waste if it's something you're going to do for the entire year. And I think that's the way you actually to build the community in this by setting the stage of how you want to engage in their learning. What are the questions they feel is important? Giving them primary sources and saying, what questions do you have about this? What are you curious about? What do you want to go learn more about? Because as they're answering those questions, you're learning about them. You're finding ways to, to move them in and out of small groups to help build that community. But I think it's really setting the tone for like, this is a collaborative learning environment. This is not a class where I'm going to sit in front of you and give you names and dates for the next 175 days. But I'm going to give you some topics. I'm going to give you some ways to think. I'm going to give you the tools to negotiate and work with a primary source. And then you tell me where you want to go with it. Um, and that's when I do curricular work. I try to build out these, these inquiry arcs that allow for that. But it's setting the stage with what do you want to know? What do you want to learn about? And you can do it with a little bit of that content in mind. But I think this is the perfect piece to just say, you know, for those first couple of days or weeks or whatever like that, how many people have dealt with a primary source before? How many people know how to source a document? What is this? Why is this? Who do you want to learn more? Like those pieces that are 100% transferable across any content that they're going to get later in the year with you and next year with anybody else. And I think that's the stage we should be setting. And I think because it's a bottom up approach to what they're wanting to learn and engage, I think you're I think you're just setting the stage for community building with those kids. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And I do think, um, you know, for better or worse, this, this topic is one that is going to really connect with students um, in particular. These are, these are moral questions, uh, safety questions, health questions they've been grappling with. Um, for months now, and they're probably going to be pretty well primed to uh, to dive into some of this depth in a way that they might not be able to with our bicentennial materials and things like that. So I, we, we do hope that this is helpful to you at this time. Yeah, I think the caveat too is that everything that we're creating is really just a jumping off point. Um, so it's giving the teachers the opportunity to take subject matter and then um, let the class go where they want to with it. I know for having been one of the people involved, you know, in, in pulling the materials together, the whole piece on the tuberculosis in the sanatorium was just absolutely fascinating um, in terms of just finding out Maine's history um, associated with that. Was, I never knew it. Um, and uh, it made me want to know more. Um, so I think that's part of it is it's like, again, it's the spirit of inquiry. That's what we're basing everything on. And then, um, you know, it's kind of open-ended um, as to where, where you can go with it. But these are really jumping off points. Thank you, Allison. I, I wanna open it up now. Um, we've got just over 10 minutes left. Um, if you have any questions for any of the panelists here today, um, anything else you'd like to cover, questions for your fellow participants, um, please feel free to share them now. 
Um, I would also ask that if you had topics that you wanted us to explore in the future, um, that would be really great to know too, that if you, you want primary source sets to go in a certain direction or with a certain theme, just shout it out. <laughs> yeah, and we've got a section in the evaluation for you to be able to add that in too, so get your brains working. <laughs> Do you have a need for like a Google form? Like, would that be something that you would make and include in that? Or would that just be something that, you know, you'd let other people kind of do? If that seems like a useful tool, we could definitely build that up as um, kind of a companion piece to it. I think that, uh, let's see, just looking at the worksheet analysis worksheets, I think most of them you should be able to answer in a Google form format. Um, one thing we visually tried to figure out in this form is how to get students past the I don't know. Um, because if you're asking them, when was this picture taken? Um, there's no date on there. They just say, I don't know. And they just kind of shut down. So we built the form out. So it'd say like, no, I don't know the exact date, but I can guess. And that would be the only thing I would be trick think would be tricky to do on the form is replicate that. But um, that would be something where um, it just takes a little bit more, uh, maybe coaching from the teacher to say, well, don't just answer no, like just make a make a guess based on what you can see. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, make a well, actually, here's a question. Um, I don't know enough about the Google format to know if I build a Google form, I'm not sure if I can transfer ownership of that to someone else or if I would just get all of your students and can copy. Oh, copy. I yeah. was going to say, Kate, you can build it and set it as a force copy so that if anybody clicks on the link, they have to make the copy. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. So I yes. have a question. Are most of the teachers actually using Google Classroom? Is that kind of the predominant set up for most across the state. Got some nods there. Yep. And Marie, you had a question? I just want to piggyback off what Danielle was saying. I think, and I haven't obviously gone through and worked with the materials. So I'm really excited to do that. But one of the biggest struggles for us at the end of last year as teachers was trying to figure out how to transfer material we had into a format that kids could interact with and vice versa. And like that was the part that brought me to tears. So just making things accessible for teachers to then give to kids on the Google um, format would be super helpful. Yeah, okay, that's good to know because th that's something I hadn't thought of. I know high school students are probably used to downloading things and uploading again, but that would be a whole nother obstacle for other folks, so. Well, and sometimes for me, it was even like, oh, I had this whole sheet of sources, but I only want kids to look at one to try to separate it out into like one PDF or whatever, like for some people, that would be easy as pie for me. That was a two hour struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, note from Kyle that they're using Canvas for the first time this year. Okay, so that's another platform teachers are using. Yeah, I think that's a takeaway for us too. It's really understanding the platforms they're using. Cause I know when um, we started this, I started looking into Google Classroom and it was, there wasn't a comprehensive program for libraries because we were looking at it um, as just a resource that we might want to employ, but it was more set for the schools. So uh, it's definitely something that is a takeaway for us in terms of understanding the platforms they're using because it is the accessibility mm -hmm. to whatever we're doing. Yeah. The Smithsonian has a great tool a great site called learning lab where you can create your account and you can go through everything that's in the smithsonian so i'm sorry i'm taking away now from the main pieces um but you can collate all your sets and then even say like well this is for my u.s history course or this is for my first hour u.s history course this is for my and you can assign them out because it's that piece of you go to the smithsonian right and say go find something you're going to be there for days you can go through everything and say, here's the 10 for you. And it's done accessibly online, then um, sorted however you want sorted. That's okay, Joe. I'm, I'm sure the Smithsonian's also worried about what we're creating as competition. They're like, oh, Maine's right on, hot on our tails. Okay. They, I have to admit, they called me and they said, well, will you at least plug us today before we lose all of our business to 
to mean. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure our budgets can compete with theirs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good point, though, that, you know, I think our strength as a collaboration is that we do have these main specific things, like who knew that the town of Orrington had these great things about what they burned during smallpox. So you can go to the Smithsonian, get, get that big picture overview of smallpox at the global level, and then bring your students to, um, you know, throw in a couple resources that came from down the street from them and add in that extra level. But I think that there's, you know, there's really no competition here. I think that these are all great tools to get students thinking about that stuff. And I think the local, you know, the main and taking pride in your state and having, you know, that rich history um, makes it, I don't know, makes it more personal too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm trying to decide because we do in seventh grade, we do main history, economy and geography. And I usually start with geography, and I'm wondering if I should start with history, like this, and, and make it this. Like I what I used to do, the economy early on. You know what were the top money makers in Maine, but I'll probably like I really like this today, and I'll probably do, I'll probably do this for my history target. And I was just wondering if anyone had any ideas, like if I should do geography first, the geography of Maine first, or just do hist, I don't know. Yeah, I'm wondering if the geography doesn't provide the context. And so you understand, you know, thinking, yeah. and, and then you get all the, you have, it's so disparate. I mean, that's one of the special things about Maine is the geography is so important and the local history is so important. Um, and then just, you know, and the cultural differences, even across the whole state. So you could start with the geography and then, and then even focus in on the history, depending upon your locale or, or the surrounding towns and things, and then broaden out from that. And then, and then dive into the history. And then certainly even in the discussion of the pandemic, there's a whole economic conversation around that yeah. As, yeah. as well. Um, so they kind of linked, um, that's just a thought. Yeah, thank you. That's a tricky part yeah. for me that they all link. So it's like, what yeah. do you start with? And then yeah. how do you stay there and not like, yeah. And limited time too, I'm sure, yeah. where you can cover each and you want to do it thoroughly. So, yeah. And so for me in seventh grade, which I didn't get to main studies last year because I was waiting for 2020, the bicentennial. Well, okay, that didn't happen. Um, so I am going to pick it up in eighth grade because I loop with my kids. Um, but I don't try to separate them out or tease them out. I do teach them all together. It's one of the great things I love about social studies is that we can teach so many different aspects of life together. So, you know, and maybe that's not your style, but this would be a good time to just try that. Like, don't try to teach the overall geography. Like, just focus on, you know, this one area. And maybe those are those maps are your primary sources if you could find those older maps from that time. Thanks. And I will say the archives has about 5,000 maps in our collection. So if uh, you, of a particular geographic area that you're looking for, just please reach out. Actually, I had a question about that. Two questions, actually. The first one I'll just go off of. What is the digitization process like? So I've been using a lot of, um, I do a lot of mostly source-based lessons, um, and I've been using many of the resources that you've mentioned, but I've been wanting like older maps to go along with a, you know, like, um, John Smith's description of New England, for example. So like, okay, now we're going to look at like Sagadahawk, this, this like area of the coast. Um, and I was wondering if we had like main specific or um, non-European maps of the area and if they were going to be digitized or if is that something like I enjoy going to archives, apparently I can't go now, but like, is that something that I would have to go and trek up to Augusta? Um. I can speak to that. So we do have um, many, many of our maps digitized because that is a collection that is so frequently requested. So that is a project that is ongoing um, because of the sheer number that we have. Um, talking about the very early maps, we have the Baxter Rare Map Collection, which is available to you on our website, digitalmain.com. Just do a search for Baxter Maps. And then we have uh, a really interesting collection of the main land office maps, which are 
some of them predate statehood. So we've got some Massachusetts maps um, and then uh, interesting look at the division of Massachusetts and Maine and the setting of the border. So um, I'd be happy to talk with you in depth. Just shoot me an email. It's heather.moran, M-O-R-A-N, at maine.gov, and I'll put that in the chat. My second question uh, is to uh, this, this project you guys are doing, uh, and to what extent have you thought about using oral, oral history sources? And if that's something that you guys were thinking about doing, what would that look like? Um, we actually, uh, um, I actually was, was gathering some oral history for another topic that we were, is one of the topics that we had actually talked about doing um, in the future, um, thinking that it would be really interesting to include that. Um, we kind of pivoted on pandemics and, and didn't really see, you know, that any of our collections maybe had that. It's more in the letter format, but I think that we would definitely, um, if it was available to us, um, want to do oral history. I, I think it would be a shame to, to avoid that as a, as a source. Um, certainly we have some really great collections in the state, not necessarily within our collections, but things that we can, um, the Folk Art Center, and um, th that, that could cover some of the topics that we hope to dig into um, in the future. And it did come up when we were talking about the tuberculosis. That was because uh, right. we thought that could have been accessible, that someone could have lived through it or known someone that lived through it and, and had um, a history to share. But um, we ran out of time. But that could still be something we could add to that particular topic as well. That's right. Thanks, Allison. I, I totally forgot about it. The minute you said that, I remembered that conversation. All right, so we're at three o'clock now. Um, I want to respect folks' time. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes, but I did want to make sure in case people have to duck out. Um, there is a link that I shared in the chat, and I'm going to pop it up again right now um, to get your contact hours, the two hours for this event. Um, all you have to do is fill out this Google survey, um, and once you hit complete, the link will pop right up. So make sure you don't close your window right away after finishing it because that pops right up and you can click over to it and it'll, uh, fill out your own certificate and either save it or print it for your, um, for your contact hours. Even if you don't need contact hours, we would love to get your feedback on today's webinar. Um, we are obviously in the beginning stage of this, of this project. We want to make it stronger and more useful. So anything you have to add would be helpful. All right, and it looks like Joe just popped up another link for Maine and Maps. Great. All right, any other comments before we sign out today? Danielle, if you want to think about your units, because I will echo what others were saying, they're not, I don't think you can separate them. So I think you separate your units by questions and then you guide in the piece. I, I write everything through a question. Um, and so you can have a question that might be economic focused, um, but like the one example I think about when I come back to Maine, like the economy of Maine is heavily based on the geography. You don't yeah. farm in Portland, you don't fish in the county, there aren't potatoes in the mountains, there aren't, right? Like, so you have to automatically, you have to start layering all those pieces in. So I wouldn't think about it necessarily in terms of the strands, I would think about the questions you would wanna build that as kids answer, they will pull in all of the, the pieces you want them to cover. Yeah, thank you. That, that's kind of what we do for, as far as economy and geography. Those definitely go together, but it, it's tougher for me to decide, like, where do I pull in the history? But I usually do it af, like I, after I do economy and geography, kind of we do the history of economy. So yeah, something to just for me to think about, but thank you for the suggestions. And you can reach out to me at any time. I will put my contact in there. People have heard me all spring, summer saying, if I could just have a hobby that I got paid for, it would be, right? The Heather's laughing. She's heard me say so many I love writing um, compelling questions that would like bring the pieces in. Because right away, like thinking about the history and geography, like the geography of Maine isn't even set until the history of Maine 
moves along. So thinking about farming in Aroostook County, that's not Maine for a while. Maine isn't even Maine. It's Massachusetts for a while. And true. And so how do you ask the question that kids are like, wait a minute, huh? What? Can I go learn more? Yes. Yes, you can. Great. All right. Any other comments before we head out today? Is everyone able to access the link to that evaluation form? All right. Good. Seeing some thumbs up, some nodding. That's great. Well, I want to give everyone a huge thanks um, for joining us today. Uh, if there's anything you missed and want to revisit, or if you like seeing your own little screen show up, feel free to check out the recording when that comes up in a little bit. Um, we've, uh, yeah, we're, we're very excited to be able to spend the time and share this with you folks. Uh, best of luck to all of you. I know this is, you know, teaching is always tough. I have such a great respect for classroom teachers and this fall is going to be a real doozy. So uh, thank you for all you do. And please don't hesitate to reach out. Everyone on this panel is happy to um, help you get what your students need for this fall. Um, yeah. And thank you to Joe for hosting us today and all that. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks thank so much. You.